Well, thanks for coming along this afternoon to my session. Um, I'm going to give you a talk about linked data. Um, so far at Strata, there seems to be an awful lot of uh, discussion about how best to process data, analyze data, and derive insights from it. Um, my talk's going to be more focused on how we actually publish data, how we bring it to the web, how we can share it and make it more accessible. Um, just so I've got a sense of uh, people's background, how many people are familiar with the semantic web, RDF? Oh, OK, most of you. <laughs> That's a surprise. OK, so how many people uh, think the semantic web uh, isn't working and will never work? <laughs> OK, OK, there's, a, there's an overlap there as well, which is interesting. OK, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to convince you that uh, the semantic web is working or not. But what I want to try and do is highlight what I think is a trend towards linking up and connecting up data sets that's coming not just from the, the semantic web world, but from other initiatives as well. And I think it points uh, towards uh, an important way for us to make data more accessible. Um, let me tell you a bit about myself to start with. So my name's Lee Dodds. Uh, I'm the CTO for a data marketplace startup called Kasabi. We're based in the UK. Um, uh, I've got a technical background. Uh, I spent a lot of my time over the past few years um, working and researching on how to make data more accessible. And that's covered everything from good API design, best practices, through to ways to store, query, and manage data, and even through into non-technical issues, uh, like how we actually license data and how we judge data quality. Um, I've worked with quite a number of different organizations. Um, one of the projects I've been most proud of was um, the work I did with um, data.gov.uk, looking at how to open up uh, government data in, in the UK, working on some of the best practices and making that data accessible. So, <clears throat> as I say, what I want to try and talk you through is this, this notion of linked data. Um, and we'll talk about some of the semantic web concepts, but I also want to try and uh, highlight why I think linked data is useful, why I think it's useful in a, in a big data world, um, and also, um, as I say, highlight some of the uh, trends around connecting data across the web. <clears throat> the first thing we need to talk about is identity. Identity is a bit of a, a tricky beast. Um, reasonable people can disagree about how to identify something. Different communities, different organizations can have uh, a different view of the world, a different way to identify things out there in the world. So people and places and books and film, TV, recipes, anything we might reasonably want to capture or publish some data about. So what we find is that uh, different communities start out creating identifiers for the things that interest them. And then at some point, we realize that actually we need to start to integrate those different views of the world that we have to do some system integration between two different, uh, two different organizations, maybe because they're merging, maybe because they're in a supply chain, maybe just recognize that if we partner and share data, then we can um, derive some value from that. So what happens then is, you, is we start to see uh, efforts to try and normalize or rationalize those different identifier systems to see if we can line them up so that it makes it, uh, it makes it easier to do that integration so that we can map from one system into another. Now, it's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of value in being, in being the owner of the, the identifiers within your particular domain, and lots of organizations want to do that. They want their identifier to be the de facto standard way to do integration within their, within their domain. So organizations spend a lot of time trying to be definitive, and making sure that they can map their identifiers into everybody else's scheme so that you will always go to them um, to, to do any data exchange. So we can see that, um, we can see that happening. I'll talk about a, uh, one particular use case in a minute. Um, the natural uh, next step beyond that is moving, data, moving those uh, identifiers out into the public domain. So removing, them from, uh, removing the, the IP that surrounds them to make them more open and so that no one organization um, owns uh, all of that value. And we can see that that's already happened in some domains. It happened in academic publishing quite, some, uh, quite a few years ago through the adoption of the DOI as a standard way to identify research content. Uh, and it's happening right now in the media space. 
um, with the uh, arrival of the EIDR, which is very similar. It's uh, just an identifier for describing um, film and, and TV objects. So <clears throat> we can look at uh, other areas where this has happened. So geographic identifiers, there are and always have been a wide range of different identifiers for points of interest, places, and countries. And we've all had issues of trying to map between different identifier schemes. So what it, what's been interesting is to see just over the last couple of years how various organizations have tried to um, do uh, some level of normalization between these different identifiers. So back in, I think it was April 2010, Yahoo, uh, who had their Where on Earth ID as the kind of definitive identifier for points of interest, they launched what they called their concordance service, which was a way to map their identifiers into other people's identifier scheme. And then April last year, um, uh, Foursquare announced that they were doing the same thing, and they were trying to create a Rosetta Stone uh, for, for, for the geospace so that if you've got a Foursquare ID or any other identifier, you could, you could freely interchange it. And then at the end of last year, um, Factual announced their Crosswalk API, which was going to be a Rosetta Stone for geo-identifiers. So they all, they all recognize that there's a problem. There's a need to be able to do that um, uh, mapping and normalization between identifiers. And we see different organizations trying to kind of own that particular space. So... I think um, the, the metaphor of Rosetta Stone is the wrong one in this, in this particular case. So there will always be some value in being able to just translate identifiers between two different systems. But I think in most cases, when we want to do that translation, we don't expect that there's just going to be the same content, the same data in the other system. We're, do, we're doing that translation because we want to find more data, find more context which we can use when we're building an application or doing some analysis. So I think a better metaphor is a switchboard. We're using identifiers to route us from a data set that we know and understand into somebody else's data set where hopefully there's more context and more information that is going to add value to what we're doing. <clears throat> well, we, we can, I think we can, we can ask, uh, reasonably ask, does this pattern have to play out? Is this just a natural way that we... We build systems and architect data. Or can we take a different approach? Currently, when we create um, identifiers, create keys within our data sets, just, they just tend to be numbers or alphanumeric strings. And so given an identifier, you don't know what to do with it. You need some extra context. You, know, you need to know that it's a telephone number rather than, say, a product code. Um, so you need some out-of-band out of context in order to be able to process it usefully, in order to know how you could take that identifier and do something with it, like find some data that's associated with it. And then, of course, if you don't have the right identifier, then you need to know where you can go to a Rosetta Stone API and do some mapping into something you do understand. But can we do it differently? Why can't we just use the web to do this? The web's a great, way, great and proven way to be able to find information and drive uh, discovery of new information. So why can't we use the web as the, our fundamental um, identifier space? And that's really what the semantic web and the linked data movement is all, is all about. It's about moving from um, creating local identifiers, which are scoped to our organization uh, or scoped to a particular community, and creating global identifiers that are much easier to share and are out in the open for, for anyone to use. So this is where kind of linked data comes in. So the semantic web as a, as, a, as a vision and a set of technologies have been around for quite a few years. But the linked data movement started, I think it's about three years ago. Um, and it really started as a, a kind of grassroots effort uh, amongst a number of people in the semantic web community who said, OK, well, there's a, there's a big vision for the semantic web about how if we've got enough structured data, we can do some really interesting, exciting things with... Uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and reasoning, but we, need, we can't get to that unless we can do the more fundamental thing of connect data up across different organizations. So <clears throat> the goal was to forget about the big vision and just concentrate on the, th those initial steps. So pick off the basic technologies in the semantic web stack, which means um, uh, URLs, URIs to identify things, 
um, and RDF, which is the basic uh, data model for the semantic web. So it looks like most of you are familiar with RDF already, but just to summarize, in RDF, you identify things, resources, and you make statements about them. So you associate properties with those resources. And a property is either a simple literal value, so height or uh, color, um, or it's a relationship. So it's a way to tie two resources together. Uh, one useful relationship is an equivalence link, which says these two things are actually the same. So these two identifiers refer to the same thing. But you can have relationships for, for whatever, you, whatever you like. So to say that, for example, San Francisco is within California. So the model is very straightforward. But when you start to um, collect together all of these facts, all these relationships, you can build a big graph of connections. So what the, what the linked data movement is trying to do is do that at web scale. So if we all start to publish our own individual data sets, can we connect them up across the web? So that's what people have set out to do. <clears throat> There's three basic steps to publishing linked data, all of which are very straightforward. So the first is to adopt, um, uh, adopt the web as the identifier space. So we use HTTP-based identifiers, URLs, to uh, identify all of the entities, all of the resources in our data set. So simple example, here's a URL that identifies a school in the UK. So it's a URL that's grounded in uh, the data.gov.uk domain. So it's, it's a, it's the identifier is coming from an official source. So as well as being an identifier, there's actually some notion of provenance in there as well, because I can go back to um, the source of that information and, and check whether it is actually referring to what I think it refers to. So we, we, we generate URLs rather than simple numeric codes. But then we need to make those URLs actionable. If I just give you a number, you don't know what to do with it. If I give you a URL, you can immediately do something with it because you can click on it. And you can go to go and see what information you get when that uh, you know when that URL responds. So we can we don't have to just uh, deliver HTML human readable content from the URL. We can put data there as well. And in fact, we can do both. So if what you were to go to that URL in your browser uh, or use curl um, to uh, request the page, you'll get a web page. And as you might expect, the web page has got all of this essential data about that school. So it's got its name, it's got its size, it's got its address. So it's useful to you as, as a human being. But if you say, actually, I want JSON instead, or some other machine-readable format, then that's what you get back. So we can use web infrastructure, we can use content negotiation to deliver the right content, the right data, to the right type of client. Humans get something they can read. Machines get something that they can process. And we can put <clears throat> as many different formats as we like behind those URLs. Um, <clears throat> so linked data encourages that you use uh, uh, one of the RDF formats, of which there are several. But you can also put um, whatever XML or JSON formats would make sense for your particular community or your, your expected uh, user base. The third step is you then need to link to additional data. So that means including links in, in that response, not just to your data, but to other data on the web. So that means that, <clears throat> as a human being, I can click on those links, and I can find more data that comes from, from you, your organization, but I can also click and find more information that's out there on the, on the web, so other, other resources that are related to that school. And machines can do the same thing. So we can drive data discovery just by following links, exactly as we do when we're kind of browsing the web ourselves. So we can crawl to aggregate data from lots of different sources. And really, that's it. That's all that linked data is about. It's a very simple concept. And what, it's, what I think it's re trying to recognize is that there's a certain set of use cases. So being able to uh, resolve an identifier into some useful data and being able to find useful extra data that is, is context for that, that those use cases, we don't need to build a separate set of APIs and then worry about how we get people to implement clients for that. We can just do that using existing web infrastructure. If we offer APIs onto our data set, then they can do something more. They can offer um, more complex ways to, integrate, to query 
uh, or filter or work with the data, but we don't need an API just to, put, just to make the data itself accessible. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into more detail about linked data in this session. I'm going to make a shameless plug here for a, a free ebook, um, which I wrote with a colleague of mine. It's called Linked Data Patterns. So if you're interested, it's available online, or you can download it as, a, as, a, as an ebook for your Kindle. So it's, what I've tried to do there is codify a set of useful patterns for creating identifiers, creating web identifiers, and publishing and modeling and uh, ultimately consuming uh, linked data. <clears throat> so I said this, this linked data effort has been going on for a few years. So uh, as the community has been working with different data sets and uh, trying to link them together, they've been mapping their progress. So uh, this is the diagram that was of the linked data cloud, as it's referred to. Um, that was put together in September last year. So it's already quite out of date. Um, I'm not expecting you, can, you need to read uh, the labels on there. I just actually wanted to give you a kind of high-level view because if you treat it as a weather map, there's some interesting things that you can, you can see at that scale. Um, so the first thing is you can see it's color-coded. So that, those color codings represent different domains, so different, um, different areas that are starting to publish data. So the green over on the right-hand side is publishing. The, uh, ye on the left-hand side, I think that's all government data. The blue towards the top is media data. The, section in, the kind of pink section in the bottom, that's all biomedical data. So there's lots of different communities that are starting to uh, surface their data in this way. And you can see, um, <clears throat> based on the links, the lines between the data sets, how they all start to link up. And so the other thing that you can see from the diagram is that the network effects that we see on the web, the emergence of hubs, key information resources, is happening on this web of data, just as it happens for um, the web of documents. So right there in the middle, you can, the, the data sets there are uh, things like Freebase and uh, DBpedia, which is a machine-readable version of Wikipedia. So with Wikipedia has got lots of identifiers for things that people are interested in um, uh, capturing data about. So lots of people are connecting their data sets into Wikipedia, into Deepipedia. <clears throat> so if I'm writing an application, I can start from any one of those data sets, and I can just follow links and discover more data, um, more data within a particular domain, or I can find more data from some other related domain. And I could use that in, in quite a lot of different ways. <clears throat> so is it useful? Well, I think it is in the sense that we can, um, we can more, uh, more effectively, more easily discover useful data that we can use to power our applications and we can use to power um, a kind of analyses that we're doing in a kind of big data world. And we can, use, we can do that by just applying um, standard web techniques, standard kind of web crawling techniques to bring all the data together. Because it's all being serviced as, as RDF as well as other formats, then it's all in one, um, one basic data model, which we can then con consume. We don't, have to we don't have to store that as RDF. We don't have to consume it or process it as RDF. But it's in a common model that makes it easier for us to do ingestion from the linked data cloud into whatever systems that we want to uh, uh, use locally. <clears throat> uh, so th I was chatting to... Um, Matt Biddulph recently, and he had a, quite a nice way to characterize um, how uh, the kind of two types of data that you use when you're doing some kind of big data analysis. Um, he said that there was reference data and, and uh, activity data. So reference data is the base data layer that you use when you're doing any analysis. So it's the basic facts and figures about the things that you're interested in, about people, their connections, about places, you know, uh, geographic coordinates, etc. Linked data is, is a really good source of reference data. Um, because the, most of the emphasis from the linked data community has been trying to create identifiers for the things that people might care about the most, or what there's, there's plenty of data about from government sources, all of that reference data is readily available as linked data. So you can kind of harvest all of that data and use that as the, as the, as the base data, the base reference layer within your, uh, uh, within your analysis. So on top of that, you then uh, add in activity data. 
Right now, there isn't really a lot of activity data on the linked data cloud. That's not because it's not, uh, you couldn't publish it in that format. It's just that that's not where the, the emphasis has been. So activity data is things like web logs and your transaction records and all of the, th all of the extra kind of social activity that goes on around uh, those objects. Um, I think the other reason it's not published on the linked data cloud is that quite often that's the kind of data that an organization wants or needs to keep private. So you're usually taking that kind of private activity data and we want to mix it with useful data, useful context that you can get from the public web. And I think that's, so that's where linked data has got a really good role to play. <clears throat> There's another uh, kind of metaphor, perhaps a slightly overused one, a kind of Lego brick, uh, which I think is useful to think about here. So if we look at that diagram, there's lots of different data sets on there. And quite often, if we're building an application, what we really want to do is kind of cherry pick out a few data sets and just use those to power our application. And you might reuse the same data set in different, con uh, different contexts, different applications. So you kind of want to kind of plug them together to create a data set and then do something useful with it, derive some insights or use it to power an application. So it's kind of very like Lego that we really want to be able to treat uh, data sets as kind of useful building blocks that we can use to, as part of assembling an application. Um, and I think the, the fact that the linked data approach says there's a, there's a basic model, RDF, for capturing data, and that we're using um, ide shared identifiers, shared global identifiers, as a way to help link up and join up those different da data sets. It does start to move data publishing towards creating kind of Lego pieces, Lego data. So <clears throat> Lego have this notion of um, clutch power, which, is, which describes the ability for the Lego sets to grip together and that clutch power derives from the fact that um, Lego pieces are so highly uh, um, engineered, the precision on them is very great. So if, kind of just maybe stretch the analogy a little bit further, using common data model and using um, shared identifiers, that's what can give us the clutch power to be able to easily uh, mix and combine data sets from different sources. Okay, so I'm sure that I've still not convinced all of you that the semantic web is the, is the future. Uh, and I'm, the truth is, I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. But I think um, there's some clear benefits to the kind of linked data approach. Um, but if we look a bit wider, we look outside the semantic web community and look to see what's happening elsewhere, then I think we can start to see some useful um, convergence, useful architectural convergence around using the web to better, as, a be, as a better way to share data than just providing data downloads or using proprietary APIs. So there's a, two examples that I want to, want to mention. So the first uh, is the Facebook Open Graph uh, and their, their recently announced uh, Timeline edition. So are people familiar with Open Graph? Okay, a few of you. Okay, so, so what Facebook are doing is moving... Um, towards adoption of a graph model, similar to RDF, for uh, managing all of their data. So there's the, the, inf the information that you can get from Facebook is exposed through um, the Open Graph API. So th they just have URLs that identify people and um, the actions that they do within, within Facebook. So, they're so Facebook are re recognizing that they're dealing with a uh, social network, which is graph-based anyway, but then they're starting to expand that out by um, capturing data about the things that people are interacting with in the world. So when somebody watches a movie or they read a, read a newspaper article. So they want to try and capture all of that um, activity data and the metadata about those things so, and the reference data. So they're moving towards a, a graph model to deal with that. If you want to um, integrate with Facebook, so... Uh, add to somebody's Facebook timeline. So you can, uh, then you can do that by integrating um, with their API. So if somebody clicks that they've read, uh, say, a news piece on, on your website or watched a video, then you can push uh, an, uh, a piece of activity data to Facebook. And what happens then is that they come back to your site, come back to the URL that you've given them, and they bring in the, the metadata. So to integrate with Facebook, 
with the, with the timeline, with Open Graph, you have to give uh, all of the things in your, in your website, all the things that people can interact with, a unique URL. And Facebook expects to be able to fetch that URL, do a GET request on it, and get back the data they need to drive the timeline uh, aspect of Facebook. So they don't request it as JSON. What they do in this case is extract it from the HTML pages. So it's, it's embedded as structured data in the web page, because that's a really easy way to just surface some extra machine-readable data. So you can see that's, that's most of the, the linked data approach. You know, it requires you you're using URLs. It requires you delivering data when somebody requests it from that URL. And it's, and it's a, a graph model. Um, so that's one example. But then we can look at schema.org. How many people are familiar with schema.org? OK, a few more of you. OK, so <clears throat> schema.org is an initiative from all of the major search engines. Um, and what they're trying to do is standardize how structured data is put on the web for the, th the things that people care about the most, the things that people, or at least what they're using search engines to find. So they've got together and said, OK, we want, to, we want to try and normalize how people are describing uh, points of interest or businesses or movies uh, or themselves. So let's have a uh, standard schema for all of those things. Uh, and let's agree on, on what properties we're going to have to describe a person or a movie. Uh, and let's make sure that we give them all a unique identifier, which happens to be a URL. And because we're going to be crawling your website, the best way for us to uh, take that data is, is to extract it from the web page. So it, they're expecting um, people to be able to improve their search engine rankings by embedding data either as uh, microformats or as microdata or as RDFA, which happens to be a um, semantic web format. Um, you can embed that into the web page so the search engine can extract it. The, everybody is supposed to be using a standard uh, data model, so it's easy for the search engines to, um, to process it. They don't have to worry about all of the variation that they've had to deal with in the past. And you can see that, too, is very aligned with the, the kind of semantic web and linked data approach, because they're, kind of, they're pushing to, to, for people to use URLs and to adopt a standard model. In fact, it's a little bit ironic in that Early on, a lot of the, uh, the criticism of, of the semantic web space was that no, people just wouldn't be able to come together and agree on how to describe a person or a place, that it would just be too difficult. Um, and so most of the people in the semantic web community kind of stepped back a bit and said, well, that's not really what, what we're trying to do. What we're saying is if you share your schemas, then maybe we can get some convergence. Maybe kind of common models will bubble up. Uh, and then it will make every, you know, everybody's life easier because when you do follow links and you do discover data, it's more likely that you'll be able to process it. But um, people in the semantic web community didn't have the same clout as Google and Microsoft. So when they said, no, we're all going to have a standard way to describe a person or a movie, then everybody kind of fell into line. So it, it's kind of not come from that uh, same background, but again, it's kind of uh, really... Um, ticking off many of the same kind of architectural principles that I think the semantic web uh, has been built on. So regardless of which approach and which technologies win out, and you know, that, that process is as much a social one as it is a, a technical one, then I think um, look, looking at how we can better publish data on the web, how we can make it easier to, for people to discover data, to resolve identifiers, into useful data is one that's really worth looking at. So um, that's all I have to say. So thank you for listening. So I think we've probably got a bit of time for a question. OK, we've got one at the front. So the question was that there's a big disconnect between NoSQL community and the semantic web community. Um, I would say yes and no. I can kind of see. So for me, um, as, as I move to adopt so, uh, RDF and semantic web technologies in the applications I was building, the reason I did that 
was for many of the reasons that people are moving to NoSQL solutions now, is that uh, a schema-free or schema-light environment is a great way uh, to do agile development, right? Because I, I can just iterate on my, on my data model and, and kind of make decisions about what the formal schema will be much later, if at all. So to me, I've always kind of, in my mind, that, that, those kind, that kind of uh, has been very much aligned to the kind of NoSQL approach. And if there's a disconnect, it almost just seems to be that the communities aren't using the same language to, to, to talk about. Yeah, I'm not sure. How, I'm not sure how best to solve that, but it, it would be great if those communities uh, <laughs> talked more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so the, uh, the, the comment, uh, well, if you want to speak up, can you? Uh, so the comment was about um, that, that a lot of the kind of NoSQL focus has been focused on the kind of infrastructure and on how to do that really well and really effectively, whereas the semantic web community is more focused on sharing data and data processing. So they've kind of been talking about different problems, but while they may be approaching it in, it, while they may be using, uh, approaching it in slightly different ways, you know, fundamentally it's about kind of moving away from tabular data into other, into other data structures, but they're at kind of different, different levels. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. Okay, so the question was, do I see any progress in triple store development that uh, uh, matches the kind of uh, development that's happening in other NoSQL databases? Um, so the truth is, is that it's, uh, it's, it feels like it's still very early days for most triple stores. Just over the last 12 months, there have been uh, a lot of, I think there's been a lot of innovation. There's a lot of uh, new products that have come um, uh, onto the market that are uh, kind of in that space and that are aiming to do much more efficiently than what's happened in the past. Because uh, a lot of those early triple stores were built by researchers, you know, or that were building efficient data management wasn't really their, their focus. They were trying to, you know, kind of grapple with some of these other kind of semantic web technologies. There's, a, there's also a whole set of uh, systems out there that would just describe themselves as graph databases, which, which have made claims about the kind of next, uh, you know, next level of scaling. And they're not really describing themselves as triple stores because they're, opt they're kind of designed just to hold graphs in general rather than optimizing for kind of RDF and kind of Sparkle, which is the query language. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming.